with just a handful of different types of affordable, readily available hardware, you can level up your 3D printed projects from limited use, fragile plastic toys to full scale mechanical wonders. And in this video, I'm going to give you a complete list of which components to buy, what they're used for, and how they help you make your 3D prints more functional. Welcome back to The Next Layer, the channel that is all about using 3D printing to solve your problems, express your creativity, and build cool stuff. In my popular 3D printed tools video recently, I asked you all to comment below if you'd like to see another video where I outline the different types of hardware I've learned to keep in stock in order to level up my 3D printing projects. And you guys, as always, were so awesome about leaving comments and encouraging me to actually do it. Now, I also wanted to make this video because, as you all know, I'm really, really impatient. And so when I am bottlenecked on a project because I don't have the parts that I need on hand, I end up paying for it through the nose with things like overnight shipping or buying from overpriced local hardware stores. Some of you may remember that in my 3D printed micro jib video, it cost me $30 just to get some screws for weights because I didn't plan ahead. Instead, I've learned that by ordering in advance and keeping all different types of hardware and parts on hand just in case, I can avoid paying exorbitant amounts for them when I need them in a pinch. So without much further ado, let's dive right in, starting with the obvious, but stick around to the end because I also have some surprising and lesser known and frankly downright funky goodies that I know you haven't thought of using yet. Like I said, we're going to be starting out with the obvious because this was the first piece of hardware that I ever ordered for my 3D printed projects. And without a doubt, it is the single most used category of hardware. I'm talking, of course, about nuts, bolts, and washers. I'm quite sure that you've encountered all sorts of 3D prints that call for various types of nuts and bolts, ranging from mounting things on your honeycomb wall or 3D printer to bolting them together or even reinforcing different parts. In fact, if you've ever built a Prusa printer, you know just how much you can level up your prints just by adding bolts, nuts, and square nuts. Now, I don't actually keep square nuts on hand, but I do keep a variety of nuts, bolts, and washers of different lengths and sizes. Now, for the purposes of 3D printing, I recommend that everyone keep M2, M3, M4, and M5 bolts, plus the complementary washers and nuts. You can, if you want, keep M6 parts on hand, but I have to be honest, I've only ever used them on my micro jib project, which if you haven't seen yet, you can actually check that video out up here. Now, speaking of my micro jib project, one tip that I learned the hard way there, if you don't need nylock nuts, don't buy nylon nuts. As I mentioned in that video, I made the mistake of ordering nylock instead of regular nuts, and they didn't fit into the holes in the design, which meant a lot of hard work to jam them in. Now, what about length? Well, you never know which lengths you're going to need, and while you can cut down longer bolts to size, it is definitely kind of a pain. That's why I love the ready-made variety packs that you can get on AliExpress and other places, which offer a handful of each size, usually ranging from five millimeter up to 20 millimeter. Though for M3 and M4, I have found that I often need much longer screws, such as 25, 30, or even 35 millimeter. So I keep some of those on hand in Gridfinity bins stacked below the shorter, more used sizes. As a general rule of thumb, I suggest that you live by the rule that I've lived by for years. If you need something once, order extra because you're likely to need it again. Now, before we move on to the next type of hardware, just another quick comment with nuts and bolts, specifically on color and shape. In my experience, these types of flat headed bolts will fit in many more situations than any other type. And unlike the cone headed bolts, they won't split your 3D prints when you force them a little bit too tight. As for color, choose whatever color you like, but personally, I really prefer the anodized black versions for all my bolts, as you can tell from looking at any of my projects. Up next is another one that may seem obvious, but you'd be really surprised how few people actually keep them on hand. I'm talking, of course, about heated inserts. 
For the uninitiated, a heated insert is a knurled and threaded piece of brass that you insert into your print with a soldering iron. Of course, you can just make the holes smaller than your screws and screw directly into them. And in fact, Stefan from CNC Kitchen has done some incredible research and experimentation that actually proved that doing so is surprisingly strong. But if you plan to screw and unscrew into your part multiple times, heated inserts not only offer superior strength, but they also don't degrade over time. In fact, I'd say that no one accessory will level up your 3D prints as much as heated inserts. In fact, if you look around your house at the professionally made electronics and plastic accessories in your life, you'll find no shortage of heated inserts there too. For this reason, they're also really useful things to have around the house just for fixing up really anything. For example, if you accidentally break your kid's favorite toy because you don't know how to fold it up properly. Make your dad to the rescue. For more information on heated inserts, I recommend checking out one of my favorite channels, CNC Kitchen, where you can see research on various types of inserts, which ones work better, tutorials on how to design and modify your parts to best accept the inserts, and even pick up some ultra high quality ones made by CNC Kitchen themselves. Though personally, I just used an assortment that I bought on AliExpress, which I will also link to in the description below. Personally, I only keep M2, M3, and M4 inserts on hand, and I've never really had a need for bigger or smaller ones. Oh, and make sure that you get a flat-nosed soldering iron tip to go with your inserts because that will make inserting them evenly and straightly, is that a word? Straightly? Straightly, a whole lot easier. All right, here's one that I think is going to surprise you. NFC chips. Most of us probably don't use our phone's NFC readers much outside of paying for things with Apple Pay or Google Pay, but that's actually a real shame. Scanning an NFC chip is fast, easy, and more convenient than QR codes, and it adds an interactive element to your 3D prints. You could, for example, put your contact information into an NFC chip and embed it in a piece of artwork that you designed so people can contact you to commission a work or you could embed a link to a video onto a sign or a device or any project really, so people can tap and scan for a video tutorial of how to use it. I recently printed a company logo business card holder, and though I didn't have time to actually do this before the conference, I wish that I had just encoded a virtual business card into one of these NFC chips so that people could tap their phones instead of taking a physical business card. Now, if you wanna take this a big step further, you could also program your phone to do things based on which NFC chips you tap. For example, you can automate things in Apple's Shortcuts app or using the NFC chip feature in the smart home automation platform, Home Assistant, so that different things happen when different people actually scan the NFC chip. For example, you could 3D print a remote control dock for your television and media station and embed in it an NFC chip. When any member of the family taps that NFC chip with their phone, it can detect who's tapping it and switch the TV and home theater system on and then switch Netflix or Apple TV or whatever to their personal profile automatically. Now, this same idea could be applied throughout the house. Tap your phone on your 3D printed key holder when you walk in the door to set the lights, music, and AC the way that you personally like them, and on and on and on and on. You can even make your very own 3D printed NFC Bitcoin credit card, a 3D printed phone case that contains your contact information in a chip, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. These easy application NFC chips are small, easy to use, and really, really cheap. All you need to do is program them using an NFC capable phone. So if you want to add some interactivity to your prints, I definitely recommend checking them out. While we're on the topic of adding interactivity to your 3D prints, I wanna take a moment to thank today's sponsor, PCBWay. While the accessories and hardware in this video will definitely take your 3D printed projects up an entire level, PCBWay is your one-stop shop for going to the next level beyond that. I'm talking CNC machining parts to complement your 3D prints, PCB prototypes and assemblies, flexible and advanced PCBs, 
laser cutting, and even professional grade MGAF and PolyJet 3D printing. PCBWay does it all. Best of all, PCBWay can help you out at any scale. From their insane offer of 10 PCBs for five bucks, up to full-scale production. So whether you're designing a fun project for personal use at home or scaling up production on a commercial product you're developing, PCBWay has you covered. To check out their full line of products and services and get a free $5 coupon for new users, visit the link in the description or go to PCBWay.com. The next hardware goodie I'd like to share with you all is neodymium magnets. Now these super strong little magnets can add all sorts of functionality to your prints, such as securing them to a base in the case of gridfinity bins, closing different boxes and latches, and even attaching your prints together. I, for example, use neodymium magnets in my designs for the Bitcoin statuettes that I sell, which enable me to create secret hidey holes for Bitcoin wallets, or other secret types of things like cash. There are tons of designs out there that utilize magnets, but unfortunately, they are not all the same size. The most common sizes that you'll find are 4mm, 5mm, and 6mm diameters, but alas, there are also different thicknesses of each of those diameters. Gridfinity, for example, uses 6 by 2 millimeter magnets, whereas other models such as this hardware wallet case, for example, or my very own Bitcoin statuettes use the more common 5 by 3 millimeter magnets. And I've even designed some smaller parts that use the itty bitty 3 millimeter magnets where necessary. Your best bet then is to just buy an assortment of magnets and store them nicely and neatly in a Gridfinity container. They don't sell actual assortments, but you can find any good seller like the ones I've linked in the description and just add a bunch of different ones to your cart. Personally, I keep 3x3, 4x2, 5x1, 5x2, 5x3, 6x2, and 8x3 <sighs> magnets on hand at all times. These magnets aren't that expensive, and while you can fudge it on depth, you definitely don't want to get stuck not having the right diameter. One note on neodymium magnets, though, you can insert them with either glue, friction, or heat, but beware. If you heat them past 80 degrees Celsius, they will permanently demagnetize to some level or even completely. For this reason, if you want to heat up your magnets to insert them, just make sure that you have an adjustable heat soldering iron which operates at such low temperatures. Or just use CA glue or friction fit by adapting your models so that the magnets fit in very tightly. All right, let's get moving now. Sorry for the dad joke with some hardware that will help add motion and functionality to your 3D prints. That's right, bearings. Ball bearings can be a little bit intimidating, I think because their number conventions are really confusing. I mean, what does 608 mean? What is the difference between ZZ and RS? It's never made sense to me, but fear not, because frankly, I still don't know the answers to those questions either. And that's because the vast majority of 3D print projects that use bearings stick with the conventional 608 2RS bearings, which translates to 8 by 22 by 7. I don't know how you get from 608 to 8 by 22 by 7, but that doesn't matter. Now, I've made the mistake in the past of ordering different ones, and I never actually ended up using them, though I suppose it's not too difficult to modify the STL files of your desired project to make the diameter a little bit bigger. Which, by the way, is an idea that I've had for another video. I've actually been thinking about doing a video comparing free design softwares such as Blender versus Onshape and explaining which one I use for which type of project and why. Now, let me know below in the comments if this is something that you'd actually be interested in watching because I'm actually not sure what level of design skills my viewers have or wish to have. All right, back on the topic of bearings. 
I've used bearings in a lot of different projects, ranging from the 3D printed turntable in my 3D printed tools video, all the way to built in removable and low friction spool holders in my 3D print enclosure, the Tush popular free standing spool holder that I use with my 3D pen, and even this failed attempt at a 3D printed drill that didn't make the cut for one of my videos. Again, these projects, except for the drill, all use the same types of bearings. And so it really makes sense to just keep a dozen or so 608 bearings on hand at any given time. Plus, with this neat Gridfinity holder, you need not worry about them taking up space or rattling around in your hardware drawer. Up next, let's talk about T-nuts. With the vast majority of 3D printers today using aluminum extrusions, it has become really, really easy to securely mount things to your 3D printer, and all you really need are these wing-shaped nuts to do it. This could mean changing or improving your spool holder, mounting a Gridfinity base on your printer, attaching a camera arm or a Raspberry Pi touchscreen, or even going as far as I did with my CR10 V3 and actually converting the entire printer into an all-in-one unit with the electronics mounted underneath to the aluminum extrusions. Now these T-nuts make it all super simple. Sure, I mean, you could 3D print these, and I have, but just like with the heated inserts, if you want longevity and the ability to adjust whatever it is that you've mounted more than a few times, which frankly is one of the benefits of these sliding channels on the extrusions, then it really pays to order some metal ones. Personally, I only ever use the M3 and M4 T-nuts, so I'd recommend that you only keep those on hand. All right, up next, let's talk about springs. Recently, I've found that a lot of prints have called for either push or pull springs, such as the popular filament cutter or that failed hand drill that I mentioned before. Now, the problem is, unlike heated inserts, nuts, and bolts, and other items on this list, I haven't actually been able to find a decent assortment kit of springs with different diameters, lengths, and strengths. And frankly, I definitely don't need a hundred pieces of the same spring. Instead, what I've started doing is just collecting springs as I come across them and harvesting them out of things that I'm going to otherwise throw away. Old pens that you get as free promotions, for example, are probably not candidates for a refill cartridge, but make sure that you harvest those springs before you actually throw them away. Same goes for these silly Halloween headbands and a surprising amount of stuff you probably throw away every day. Generally speaking, it's a really good idea to spend a couple of minutes taking things apart before you throw them away or hopefully recycling them. Just to see what screws, nuts, bolts, springs, wires, fans, cables, sensors, cameras, and so on you might be able to use in future projects. Speaking of which, I know, I know. Fans are not really a hardware item as much as an electronic item, and you're probably not going to embed them into your 3D prints. And yet, I have to say that different types of fans are some of my most used accessories for my 3D printing projects. I've used numerous fans to upgrade my 3D printing enclosure, add on different cooling elements to my Raspberry Pis on each of my 3D printers, cool down my networking closet, improve the ventilation on my filament dryer, and of course, replace faulty fans on my 3D printers. Personally, I like to keep a wide variety of fans here and in my shed, including 40 millimeter, 60 millimeter, 80 millimeter, and even 120 millimeter. Now, I also keep an assortment ranging from five volt to 12 volt and even 24 volt fans, so that I have all my bases covered for Raspberry Pi or USB applications, standard 12 volt electronic applications, and of course, 3D printer applications, which require 24 volts. I also like to keep a blower fan or two around in case something goes awry on one of my 3D printers. Now, these fans are really affordable if you buy them on AliExpress and like everything else on this list, if you're ordering them just in case before you need them, 
we aren't in any kind of rush and we can afford to buy cheap with slow shipping. Here's another one that is technically more of an electronic goodie, but if I'm going to talk about fans, then I need to talk about this one. Now, I don't know about you, but I'm not super great at programming Arduinos and stuff like that. So years ago, I found a fun workaround for adding thermal sensitivity to my projects, thermal switches. Now, these switches are super simple to solder into a circuit, say that three times fast, and will either turn on or turn off that circuit at a certain temperature. Now, I primarily use them to turn on fans automatically in my printer enclosure, electrical closet, or filament dryer, but you can also use them to disable electronics at certain temperatures to prevent damage. For those of us who aren't great at programming, this is a quick and easy way to add functionality, and it's one of the reasons that I slap so many fans on so many different things all over my house. When ordering, just make sure you select the right temperatures. I like to keep an array from 25 all the way up to 45 degrees Celsius, and also pay special attention to whether or not the switch will turn on at that temperature or off at that temperature. Here's one that might be a little bit silly, I admit, but it's one that's come in handy enough times that it's worth putting in just one little Grinfinity bin. Keychain rings. Now, in the past, I have mentioned in other videos some cool prints that utilize these, such as the mini fillet gauge of the hole measuring tool I mentioned in my 3D printed tools video, or other types of prints which are useful enough to keep on your keychain. But I've also printed some other life-saving little trinkets such as a self-defense cat for my wife or some of those shopping cart release keys. Plus, if you, like me, love to give away 3D printed gifts, I can think of no better way than to ensure that your friends and family actually use and enjoy those 3D printed gifts than by putting them on keychains. So you can print out keychain versions of some of your favorite 3D prints. All right, we've come to the end of our list and I've saved probably one of the most important accessories for last. Let's talk about weights. One of the coolest things about 3D printing is that you can save material and weight by creating hollow prints that would otherwise be impossible. With that said, there will inevitably be some prints that you wanna add some weight to either for mechanical and functional reasons or just to give them a more hefty, high quality feel. As I've mentioned before in my 3D printed jib video, I failed to plan ahead when it came to weights. I planned to use sand, which just wasn't heavy or practical enough, and this failure to plan ended up costing me time and money. I was actually quoted as much as $140 for ball bearings just to weigh down the jib arm. Now, while I ended up only spending about $30 on screws, I could have saved even more had I been prepared. Fortunately, you guys were really great about sharing a ton of helpful comments about how I could have saved myself some money and headache. Many of you recommended picking up some fishing weights, though those were still actually really expensive to get shipped from China, and I actually don't know where to get them locally. Others had the fantastic recommendation of dropping by a tire change place and asking for their used tire weights, which I fully intend on doing the next time I pass one. In the meantime, I've begun a new habit that I want to encourage all of you to adopt. In the past, when I would break a drill bit or strip a screw, accidentally leave something out to rust, I would simply toss the metal pieces into the recycling bin. But no more. Now I collect all of these little bits and bobs in a special bin, which I save up for the next print that I want to weigh down. It's slow going, but with a toddler around the house who loves to help daddy with projects, I do get a fair number of stripped screws and broken drill bits. Plus, to help expedite this project, I recently swallowed my pride and went dumpster diving at the nearest construction site up the street, which yielded some incredibly heavy rebar. So if I need serious weight, I can use a diamond cutting wheel to cut off the appropriate length of rebar and shove that into my prints. So there you have it, my list of accessories and hardware to level up your 3D prints. I'd love to know in the comments below if I missed any. Oh, and please make sure to subscribe because a number of you have asked for other videos, including the non 3D printed tools I use 
to improve my 3D printing workflow, and I am currently working on those videos. Thanks so much for sticking around to the end. Thanks to today's sponsor, PCBWay. And as always, happy 3D printing. Thank <laughs> you.